As I look out over this congregation that your pastoral staff loves so well, it occurs to me that many of you in here may be suffering from a condition known as PDWS. You may be acutely aware that you have that condition. You may not have even thought about it. The symptoms are not severe. They are a little bit of anxiety, a little bit of fear, a little bit of sense of loss, certainly nothing that would require medication. In the counseling world, PDWS is also known as Pastor Donnie Withdrawal Syndrome. <laughs> It's real. It's real. It's been three weeks, and so you might be experiencing those symptoms. If that is you, good news is on the way. Pastor Donnie will be back in the pulpit or at the table, whatever we call this, next week. Okay? Mm -hmm. So until then, I encourage you to breathe. Just everybody take a deep breath and let it out. Okay, that's better, isn't it? Already. It's better already. And today you're stuck with me. So as I don't really tell my clients, but I think this, get a grip, get over it and get on with it. Okay. So that's what we're going to do today. When you hear the number one, I wonder what your word association is. You know, do you remember as a kid playing that game, word association? If you're an accountant like Joe, you probably think of a dollar. If you're a math teacher like Katie, you probably think of addition or something. If you're a grandma or a grandpa, like many of us in here are, you might think of a toddler. How many, this is going to date some of you, how many of you remember the song, One is the Loneliest Number? Yeah. Okay, all right. Back in the 60s, I think, yes, the 60s, let me tell you a little, little piece of trivia that has nothing spiritual to do with it. Um, when you hear that song, you might think that, oh, that was, that was the result of a bad breakup. You know, one is the loneliest number. No, the way that song was written was the man who wrote it was making a phone call, and back in those days, you got busy signals. And that busy signal went beep, beep, beep. And he liked that beep, beep, beep. So he wrote a song with that beep, beep, beep. And that's how the song came about. Honest, true story. I mean, I wasn't there, but that's what the internet says, and the internet knows, <laughs> knows everything, so we know that that is true. So when you hear the number one, you might think of lonely, or we also have the saying or the thought that there's strength in numbers, and so when you think of the number one, you might think of weakness. So there's a whole lot of things you might think of with the word one, O-N-E, not W-O-N, O-N-E. And so today I want to look at scripture and um, see how one is really a number of abundance, it's a number of strength, and it's a number of power. And we are going to um, look at a, a story that is an ancient story and try to bring it up and make it personal and current today. And if you're thinking we're going to the Old Testament you should have known that before I ever stood up here. <laughs> and if you're thinking we're going to the book of Genesis, you're right. And you're probably thinking, does she not know there's any other book in the Bible? But I love the book of Genesis. So before we go there, let's go to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Father, you are good. You are great. You are mighty. You are mighty in this place, O oh Lord. And Father, we invite your spirit. We welcome your spirit that's already here, Lord. 
Father, your word is alive and it is powerful. And so, Lord, I'm asking this day that your spirit would breathe afresh upon an ancient word and cause it to come to life for us today. Lord, I'm asking that you would use your word to pierce our spirits, to draw us closer to you, Father, to know you more intimately, and to do the work that only you can do. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, would you turn in your Bibles with me to um, Genesis chapter 18? So we're going almost to the beginning of the Bible. We're going to jump into the middle of the story, so I want to give you a little bit of background of what's going on here. The story is about a man named Abraham. God had called a man named Abraham. He was not Abraham at the time God called him. His name was Abram. God called him out of the land of Hur, which is north of Israel, and he called him to come to Israel and to begin the nation of Israel. And so um, in this particular story, what is happening, Abraham and his wife have been in Israel for quite a while now. They've had many, many things happen to them. But one thing that has not happened to them is that they have not been able to have a child. And they are well up in years. Sarah is in her 80s, and Abraham is in his 90s. And they have desired a child, but they have not been able to have a child. So what is happening at the beginning of chapter 18 is it says three men came and visited them. We learn as we read through the story that one of those men is the Lord God Almighty. And they come to visit, and Abraham, um, he, said, he says to them, come in and have a morsel of bread. But he goes to Sarah, his wife, and he says, go kill the calf and fix it. So she fixes this meal. They have this meal. Um, Side note, God ate meat, okay? Um, <laughs> for, for anybody that needs to hear that. Um, and while they are there, while they are there, God says to Sarah, who is 80-some years old women, that she's going to have a baby, okay? And immediately after dropping that bombshell... The three men get up to leave. Okay? And Abraham goes with them. Now, I don't know about you ladies, but if I got that kind of news, I would kind of want Walt to stay and help me through that, help me process that. But Abraham did not. He he left and he went with the three men, and we're going to find out that it was a very good thing he did. And I'm sure later he came back and and he consoled Sarah and celebrated with her also. So we're going to start at Genesis 18, verse 16. Then the men, that would be the three of them, set out from there, and they took, looked down toward Sodom. And Abraham went with them to set them on their way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do. Now, let me stop there for just a minute. Another little side note that's really not important. I don't, it doesn't say who, Abr who God is talking to at this point. He could have been talking to the two other persons who were with him. I choose to think that he is talking out loud because that gives me an excuse when I talk out loud to myself that God did it also, okay? <laughs> Okay, so he says, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and a mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him? For I have chosen him that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice, so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised. And then the Lord said, because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and their sin is very grave, I will go down to see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me, 
And if not, I will know. Okay, so let's talk about what's happening here. God Almighty, the one who can choose to do all things, decides that he is going to partner with a man. He is going to share his heart with a man. He is going to share with a man <clears throat> what he might do because of who Abraham was, because of the position that he had, not a position that he had worked for. He hadn't gone to school for it. He didn't have a degree for it. He didn't ask for it. It was a position that God had chosen and appointed and anointed him to have. He was to be the father of Israel. And he, all nations were to be blessed through him. Authority is rooted in position. Abraham had a position. And God was therefore sharing with Abraham what he was about to do. Because he was seeing if Abraham would step up to the plate and enter in and walk in the authority that was his because of the position. It was, in a way, a test for Abraham. God did not ask him, what do you think, Abraham? He simply set out what he was going to do and waited for Abraham to respond. Waited to see if Abraham would recognize and embrace the position that God had given to him and therefore the authority he had because of that position. Let's continue on. Verse 22. So the men turned from there and went toward Sodom. But Abraham stood still before the Lord. So the other two left. And it is God and Abraham alone, one on one. To my recollection, and maybe somebody in here knows differently. Aside from Enoch, that's before Abraham, where it said Enoch walked with God and he was no more, we don't know whether that walking was literal or figurative. But to my recollection, this is the first time that man, that God, has walked with man since before the fall since the Garden of Eden. But at that time, it was a holy God with a sinless man. Man who had not sinned. And once man had sinned, God could no longer walk with him. And here we find God choosing to walk with sinful man. Amazing. Amazing. So the men turned from there and went toward Sodom. But Abraham stood still before the Lord. And then Abraham drew near and said, What would possess a sinful man to draw near to God? What would possess him to do that? In most of scripture, we find that when God appears, by the way, that's called a theophany, when God appears in the um, Old Testament, when God appears, most of them fell on their face. Most of them were frightened. But Abraham was not only one on one with God, but he drew near to him. Was it arrogancy? Was it pride? No. We find later as we read down, it was none of those things. May I say to you, what possessed and enabled Abraham to draw near to a holy God was that he had relationship with him. He had relationship with him. This was not Abraham's first encounter with God. 
And he not only had relationship with him, but he had intimacy with him. Pure intimacy with him. Because there is relationship of all kinds of levels. You can have an acquaintance. That's a relationship of sorts. But this was an intimate relationship where Abraham felt safe in drawing near to a holy God. He not only felt safe in drawing near to him, but then he begins to converse with him. And he says, will you in, indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Okay. Suppose there are 50 righteous within the city. Will you then sweep away the place and not spare it for 50 righteous who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to put the righteous to death with the wicked, so that the righteous fare as the wicked. Far be that from you. You see, Abraham knew God's heart. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? And the Lord said, if I find 50 righteous in the city, I will spare the whole place for their sake. And Abraham answered and said, behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord. See some humility here. I who am but dust and ashes, we see a whole lot of humility here. Suppose five of the 50 righteous are lacking. Will you destroy the whole city for lack of five? And he said, I will not destroy it. And again, he, I, I will not do it if I find 30 there. Oh, wait a minute. Let me go back. Then he said, oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak. Suppose 30 are found there. And he answered, I will not do it if I find 30 there. And he said, behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord. Suppose 20 are found there. And he answered, for the sake of 20, I will not destroy it. And then he said, oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak again, but this once. Suppose 10 are found there. And he answered, for the sake of 10, I will not destroy it. And the Lord went his way when he had finished speaking to Abraham, and Abraham returned to his place. We could come away from that passage thinking that Abraham had such a merciful heart and that God was a God of discipline. We could come away thinking saving all those people or saving Sodom and Gomorrah as a whole was Abraham's idea and that he was merciful. But we would be wrong. Because you see, Abraham had spent so much time with God. He knew his heart. He knew that God was a merciful and a just God. And he was appealing to that mercy and that grace and that, that um, justice within God. It was not Abraham's. This was a test for Abraham to see if he would speak the heart of God. And he did. And I wonder what would have happened if Abraham had gone down to five. Because remember, God didn't just say, I will spare the 50 or the 45 or the 30 or the 20 or the 10. He said, for the sake of them, I will save the whole land. 
I will save even the unjust for the sake of the righteous. Do you know how many were found in the city of Sodom and Gomorrah? Four. Four. I wonder if Abraham had brought it down to four, what would have happened? We don't know that. But only four. And lest we think that the story of Sodom and Gomorrah is a made-up fable, you might want to check records of archaeology because there is ample, ample discovery that there was a city around varies between 1700 and 2300 BC, which would have been about this time era where archaeologists have discovered a certain strata in their digging where a very large city east of the, of the Dead Sea had some kind of cataclysmic event that instantaneously burned up everything. And they can tell this from the shards of pottery and things and the, sh the fragmented bones that they have found there. And they estimate that, that it was about 2,000 degrees Celsius that whew, burned this up. I don't know what I'm, atom bomb or hydrogen, but I don't know. But it, you, don't, you don't make it through that. You don't make it through 2,000 degrees centigrade. Abraham stepped up to the plate. He walked in the authority of his position. And he drew near to God and he could speak to God and he knew the heart of God because he had an intimate relationship with God. I think it's fair to say that no one in here or on the face of the earth will ever have the position that Abraham had. There will never be someone again who begins the nation of Israel. There will never be someone again who is called the father of faith. Oh, yes, there are many fathers of the faith, but not the father of faith. There will never be another person that God cuts covenant with the way he did Abraham. There will nev never be another person who fathers the 12 tribes of Israel. And so it's safe to say that no one in here will ever hold that position. But it is not safe to say, it is not accurate, it is not true, that no one in here has a position in the kingdom of God. Because every person in here has a position in the kingdom of God and therefore has authority in the kingdom of God. If you have accepted Christ as your Savior, you're a part of a family, and not just a family, but you're a part of a royal family, and that gives you authority. There are no black sheep in the family of God. If you have accepted Jesus Christ and Savior, you are a team member, and there's no one ineligible, and God equips you, and he gives you a role, and he gives you a gift, and he gives you a purpose. And with that comes authority. If you are a member, if you have accepted Jesus Christ as Savior, then you are part of his army, as we saw up here today with warrior women. There's no misfits. There's no unfit. And there's no one given absence without leave. We all have authority. The scripture says we are ambassadors for Christ, that we are priests in his home. And therefore, every person in here has a position. And with that position comes authority. And at times, God will give us opportunities, as he did Abraham, to step into our position and authority for the good of mankind.
although none of us will ever hold the position of Abraham, we can all have the relationship he had. We can all have the relationship that Abraham had with God. Relationally, Abraham was called a friend of God. That's what scripture calls him. Abraham was a friend of God. And what did Jesus say on that last night to his disciples? He said, I no longer call you servants. I call you friend. We are all a friend of God. Not because of anything we've done, but because of what he's done and what he has ordained. You know, I think there are times when we look at people in the Old Testament or, or the New Testament also, um, like, like Abraham or Moses or David or Daniel, and we think, wow, they had such a relationship with him. He spoke to them. And we think, yeah, but that's Abraham and, and Moses and David and Daniel, and I'm just me, and, and I could never have a relationship like that. That would be impossible. May I say to you, it's a lie from the pit of hell. Because maybe their relationships are held up to us, not to say that they're impossible, but to say that they are possible. This is what is possible. This is what we are to aspire to. This is what we can attain. And may I also say to you, we can have a even more intimate, get this, we can have an even more intimate relationship than Abraham and Moses and David and Daniel, does that blow your mind? Why is that? For two reasons. Because when Jesus Christ died on the cross, the veil of the temple that was a God-imposed separation of God and man that said, you may not come this close upon penalty of death if you do. But when Jesus died on the cross, God's holy hands came down through the sky, took hold of that veil at the top and ripped it in two. And in essence, he's saying, come, come, come in, come as close, come, come. And he doesn't say to someone, you can come this close, but you, oh, you, you need to stay out there. No. The invitation is for all to come close, as close as we possibly can, as close as we possibly want, as close as we allow ourselves, because he has come all the way across eternity. He can come no closer. It is we who have to draw close. That's one reason we can have a closer relationship with God, a more intimate relationship than Abraham and Moses and Daniel and David and all the others. But the other reason is God visited them at times. He did. God visited them. But you know what? He dwells within us continually, continually. They had to wait for him to come. We don't have to wait. He's already here. At any moment, any hour of the day, any minute of the day, any circumstance of the day, we can commune with him. We can talk to him. We can hear him. Intimacy nurtures, breeds, influence. Influence is rooted in intimacy. We know that to be true. Think of on the physical level. 
Who has the most influence in your life? The people that you are intimate with has the most influence in your life. You know, I think we all have people that we, when we are in a, a dire place, when we just need an answer or we need a miracle, we all have people that say, I want, uh, I need that person to pray for me. And why is that? Because we, we know that they hear from God. We say, they know how to get a hold of him. You know, we all have people like that. It's not because God loves them anymore. It's because they have cultivated an intimate relationship with him. They know him. They know his heart. They've taken that time. They know his voice. They know how to draw close. And that's not available just for whoever that them is in your life. It's true for all of us if we will just come close. Deep intimacy happens in the one-on-one. -on -one. That's true physically. You know, a couple of weeks ago, Pastor Donnie talked about loving corporate worship. And I am not refuting, let it be known, I am not refuting or negating or denying what he said. I love to worship with you all. I love the, the fullness of it and the, and the joy and the, everything that happens in corporate worship. But it cannot replace our one-on-one -on -one with him. It cannot, it cannot, I'm going to say it can't even be equal to it. It can be a really nice side dish. It can be a really great dessert, but it ain't the main meal. And it's up to us to cultivate that kind of relationship with the Father. God has been calling us here at Hope Chapel sporadically during, during different services to just be quiet and still before him. And that is a beautiful thing. I think he, he's calling us to that. He's giving us a, a taste of that. But it's not easy, is it? It's a little bit uncomfortable. Let's be honest. It is. You know why? Because the world tells us... Uh, you got to be doing something. You know, you're just, you're just wasting time sitting there. Think of the things you could be doing, okay? Because we're doing kind of people. We're doing kind of people. And, and I'm, her, I'm sure you've heard the same before. We're not human doings. We're human beings. We need to learn to just be. Just be. To sit in his presence. To soak in his presence. To worship him in his presence. You know, it's so much easier. It is for me. I don't know about for you. I'm just being... Ugly honest here. It is so much easier for me in my quiet time to, to pick up my word and start reading and journaling because I'm doing. It's, it's difficult to just sit and listen when maybe you don't hear anything. But just to be in his presence. And the other thing is, should it be comfortable to be in the presence of a holy God? I mean, I, you know, but the more we press in, the more we practice those times of quiet and solitude and listening, the more comfortable it will become, the more delightful it will become, the more fulfilling it will become. 
Intimacy enables us to earn the ear of the hearer. Let me say that again. Intimacy earns us the right to be heard by the hearer. It also earns us the right to hear things that we otherwise would not hear. Things that the noise of the world and the clatter and the clamor and the busyness drowned out. But when we come into that place of quiet and stillness before him, he whispers things to us that we would not otherwise hear. And when we practice that, Scripture confirms that God will tell us things that we would not know otherwise. And he will tell us things that he will not tell someone who does not draw near with a listening ear to know his heart. There's a beautiful um, psalm, Psalm 25, and I love it in the amplified version. And it says, the secret of sweet and satisfying companionship of the Lord have they who fear, who revere and worship him, and he will show them his covenant and reveal to them its deep and inner meaning. Another passage, another translation of that says, God shares his secrets with those who love him. I want to know the secrets of the Lord. I want to know the deep things of the Lord, the deep things of the kingdom. And I think you do too. I think you do too. As the worship team comes, I want to circle back to Genesis 18 for a moment. Because it occurred to me in reading this passage that what made me wonder, do you think it's possible that this story about ancient Sodom and Gomorrah is a prophetic microcosm of end times? Do you think that this is not just a, just a historical story that did happen, but it's got a foreshadowing of end times? Because you see, I think it does. I think it is. A lot of people, I'm sure you've heard, are, are running around asking, are we living in the end times? Are we living in the end times? You see that in on newspapers and magazines, on television, you hear that. And may I tell you, yes, we are. We are living, I can say that emphatically to you. We are living in the end times because when Jesus rose into heaven and the Holy Spirit was set, end times began. Okay? So we are living in the end times. Are we living in the end time where, I don't know, maybe, it, it could happen tomorrow. It could happen thousands of years from now. I don't know. But this I do know, that signs are happening that line up with Scripture. They're happening with more intensity, with more veracity, and they're happening. And God says that we are to pay attention to the signs, and he will share his secrets with those who seek that we might know. But this is the other thing that I know. That there are thousands, if not millions, of people just like you and me, except for one thing. 
they don't know Jesus. There's thousands, millions, maybe billions, I don't know, of people just like you and me that get up in the morning and love their families and go to work and go to school and go to games and watch television and have parties. But they're lost and they're afraid and they have no hope. And I just wonder, is God looking for Abraham's today? Is God looking for someone who will embrace the position that he has given and walk in the authority that is theirs? Is God looking for those who are, that know him well, that know his heart, can feel his heartbeat, that know his thoughts, even though they're higher than ours, that have an intimate relationship with him that will draw near and seek his secrets and receive his secrets? Is God looking for those people? Ezekiel 22:30 says, I sought for a man. There's some translations that say, I sought for one man among them who should build up the wall and stand in the breach before me for the land that I should not have to destroy it. But I found none. Abraham was that one person in the time of Sodom and Gomorrah. And he pleaded with God. And God was going to save not only the people, but the land. But there weren't enough found. And so in our time when we can see biblical signs being fulfilled and we know and yes we have that hope and yes we are going to be safe but there are millions who are not and God's looking for just one just one Will I be that one? Will you be that one? Might we have many ones that can come together? There's a lot at stake here, church. There are souls at stake here. This is not playtime. This is time for us to get serious. Embrace our position, walk in our authority, and draw near to our God. Just one can do it. Would you close with me in prayer? Father God, Almighty God, Jehovah, El Elohim, oh, merciful, merciful God. You have appointed each one of us to this time, Lord. You have appointed us, you have chosen, you have called, you have anointed. Oh God, I pray that we would rise up for your spirit is saying, church, awake. Awake, shake off the slumber. Yes. Step forth.
and the authority that I have given to you. Authority against darkness. Authority against the works of the evil one. Step into your place. Know your calling. Know that I go before you to fight the battles. Draw near to me. Draw near to me that I might reveal my secrets to you. That I might fill you and equip you and send you forth. Father, let us hear your voice. Let us respond to your call, Lord. Let us raise up as one or many ones an army of the Lord of hosts at this time. We thank you and we praise you, Lord. It's in Jesus, Yeshua Hamashim's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Oops. There's only one strong enough to say. standing with me for just a moment. Josh and Iris, would you come up here with me? Pastor Lila and Pastor Julie, would you come up here with me? His name is Jesus. He loves 
you, he loves us, and he loves our youth, which is why he brought us Josh and Iris, because they are going to be leading our youth. And just for the record, I love you guys too. <laughs> Is there anything you would like to say before we pray for you? Yeah. <laughs> Actually, just that, you know, we really love, I mean, we love the kids. We love um, what we're doing. We love our children. <laughs> but I just want to stress that, you know, I strongly believe it's our, our role as a church family to uh, it's all of our jobs to support the children of this church and this community. I live by that. My husband lives by that. I know many of you do. So I just ask, you know, as we step into this, we're not in any way like, okay, we've got it. We're, we're saying we're going to go to the front line in the battle for these children. And we're, we're, we're asking that you continue to fight for these children and that you continue to fight for the youth. And if you haven't, you know, like I love the word this morning. And when, when you were praying, you know, that you would get up, put your armor on, and stop. You know, there's no real, like, retirement in the kingdom of God. So um, just that you would come alongside us in prayer um, and just open your, that God would open your eyes to the needs of our youth, of our children, and of the community. Because there are kids in the community that we believe, too, that just may not ever be in a church, but may come with these kids and hear the name of Jesus for the first time. So we're believing that God's going to just open the community's eyes and that God would, he would even use us to touch these kids and bring them to a different place because each, each leader brings a different uh, flavor. So uh, just pray for us, please, as we walk in this and pray for the kids as they get to deal with us at a different level, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks, Pastor. Bob. All right. <laughs> yes, please, please. We are Pentecostal, right? Amen. We are Pentecostal, right? Amen. So let's see those right hands stretched out towards our brother and sister. And let's commend them and release them in the name above every name. The name of Jesus. At that name, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that he is Lord. And it is in that name that we release our brother and sister, our friends, to lead our youth. And so, Father, I ask that you would anoint them as your servants, that you would speak life through them to not just the youth of Hope Chapel, but the youth of this community. Father, I believe that there are young people that are not here this morning that will be here because of the ministry of this couple that their heart is to reach beyond four walls and to reach into a community of young people that may never, ever even fathom stepping, in foot, stepping a foot into church. But through the ministry of this couple, they will come to know the Lord Savior. They will come to know Jesus. And so, Lord, I ask that you would bless them. I, bl I ask that you would bless their home, bless their children, bless their ministry as they step into this. In the name of Jesus, we ask this, because it is his name that we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I will say this, just while we're praying, just to encourage everybody. Um, you know, when Pastor Donnie was praying, when God calls, we answer, right? That's what we all, at least hope, right? Um, and his calling, you know, sometimes it comes and you look at it and you're like, all right, I missed that one, right? <laughs> um, and we think sometimes like, you know, it was a one and done, right? It was, it, it, it came and I missed it or I didn't answer and it's done, right? Um, or even sometimes like for us, the call came 10, 15 years ago and we answered, right? This is, this is our um, second time around, if you would say, as youth pastors. Um, so for us, the call came and it was like, well, we already answered that, so that's that, somebody else, right? Maybe, maybe Pastor Lala or somebody else, right? But I guess my my point my point to it is, you know, we think God's call is just a one and done. But uh, so my my wife has uh, wind chimes everywhere at the house, 
Um, and to some people, they're annoying. You know, to some people, love they love them, right? <laughs> but I was just thinking when I was, uh, you know, that's what God's call is really like. If we, uh, I'll be at the house and, you know, the noise of the house, you don't even hear them. But as soon as you get quiet, they're always yeah. there. Yeah. Does yes. that make sense? Yes. And so his call is always there. It's always, it's not mm. that, that just okay. it came and it's it good. went. It's right. always yeah. calling. And it's just good. so encouraging yeah. us, for us and for everyone here. Yeah. Um, God's call is always, it's always calling for everyone. It's never over. It didn't just go and now it's not coming back. Yeah. Amen. Good word. Amen. Good word. Amen. Would you bless us, Pastor? Yeah, yes, absolutely. Would you put your hands forth? Bless you this morning. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord shine and smile upon you. May he shower his favor upon you. May you hear his voice in the daytime and in the night watches. And may he strengthen you with his mighty power to walk the walk that he's called you to. Have a blessed day and a blessed week, and we love each one of you. Amen.